Okay. Welcome to the fifth session of the Peking University series to celebrate the centenary of Bertrand Russell's lectures at Peking University in 1920 to 1921. My name is Arthur Shipper and I am the chair of this session. The session will proceed as follows. First, I'll briefly introduce our very esteemed speaker. Then he'll give his lecture of about an hour Feel free to write your questions to him in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screens. After the lecture, there will be a 30 minute panel discussion and general audience q and I'll first introduce our ma main panelist, Michael Raven. Then I'll present some of the Q&A questions to our speaker. Please keep them coming. It is truly a great honor for me to introduce our speaker for today. Professor Fine is university professor and silver professor of philosophy and mathematics at New York University. He holds many of the most prestigious awards and fellowships, including those from the Guggenheim Foundation, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Center for Humanities, the British Academy, and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. He's published over 130 journal articles five books, and many more are forthcoming. His work is groundbreaking and debate shaping, has been cited many thousands of times and ranges over a wide area in philosophy, especially in metaphysics, philosophy of language, mathematics, logic, and the history of philosophy, and on topics ranging from the nature of modality, the existence of arbitrary objects, vagueness, the nature of time and tense, muriology, reference, realism, hylomorphism, the nature of mathematical objects and truths, negation, and many, many more topics. He is most recently most famous for reinvigorating or rather almost single-handedly bringing the notions of grounding, essence, fundamentality, and truthmaker semantics center stage into the contemporary philosophical landscape. His methodology brings the utmost rigor, seriousness, and courage to every subject matter with which he engages. In metaphysics, he, 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 for instance, cuts through mere discussions of how we talk or the limits of our knowledge to discuss the subject matter itself. Kit Fine has deeply influenced many philosophers, including myself. And I think it is very safe to say that he is one of, and many would say, the most important philosopher alive and working at the moment. It is a great honor for me to introduce him and his lecture entitled, What is Truthmaker Semantics? to celebrate Bertrand Russell's lecture series at Peking University almost exactly 100 years ago. Hereby, we bring together two of the most profound and most important philosophers in the history of our discipline. Welcome, Professor Fine. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Arthur and Yang Jing for, for inviting me. It is indeed a, a great honor and privilege uh, to be speaking. Um, in this series. Um, I hope after that, that tribute, uh, I won't disappoint anyone, but I, I'll do my best to live up to your expectations. Uh, I should perhaps begin by saying that Russell was, was a hero of mine when I was in high school. And it was actually through reading Russell's work that I became interested in philosophy. Um, so when I was in high school, this was a long time ago, um, I, I, was, I studied mathematics for what's called A-level, which is a sort of higher exam that you take uh, uh, before you go to university. Uh, and I was uh, deeply troubled by the explanations that were given in, in calculus, especially things like gradient and so on and so forth. I, I had a sense without really being able to articulate it that we weren't being given rigorous definitions. Now, it turned out that there were two books by um, Bertrand Russell in our school library. One was Introduction to Mathematical Philosophy. So I thought, well, maybe this will have an answer to some of my concerns. And sure enough, it did. And I, I devoured the book. And uh, there's actually, among other things, an explanation of, of the limit and so on and so forth, which, which, was, uh, which was a revelation to me. Um, the other book of Russell's that was in the, the library was uh, His History of Western Philosophy. And uh, although this was very different, I also found this very gripping and in fact, I may still have these notes. I wrote a note, notes on every single chapter of that book. It's quite, quite a, big, a big book. Uh, probably as a result, I have it now, a distorted uh, view of the history of philosophy, Western philosophy, but that's, so be it. 
Um, uh, also, um, Russell, in an odd way, connects with what I'm going to be talking about. Um, because when I was teaching um, in the mid 60s at the University of Warwick, I, I, I lectured, I gave some lectures on logical atomism. And actually, then I think it's around 1967 or 68, I, I had the, the first, um, uh, first glimmers of, a tr of doing a truth maker semantics, which was to some extent had been inspired by, by Russell's work in logical atomism, which does emphasize the connection uh, between language and the facts. Um, uh, in actual fact, I wrote, um, I, wrote, um, I wrote some copious notes later, uh, which uh, actually got lost. I don't know where they are. And uh, <laughs> so it may be that if I had lost them, I would have done some of this work earlier, but, but so be it. I made up for it by, by thinking about truth making semantics for the last uh, 10 years or so. What I'm going to do in these lectures is really just give you a thumb nail sketch of what truth maker semantics is and of how it can be applied. And what I thought I might do is uh, try to bring out how truth maker semantics is, what, is part of what Daniel Nolan has called the hyperintentional revolution in philosophy. Uh, uh, and what it is about truth maker semantics and these hyper, the hyperintentional aspect of truth maker semantics that's of significance, okay? Because um, uh, this is actually, I think, is quite a difficult but, but interesting question. Uh, so I won't just be look, looking at truth makes semantics applications, I'll be looking at it in light of this more general, general theme. Okay. Uh, now, truth maker semantics is an instance of what you might call truth conditional semantics. So the basic idea behind truth conditional semantics is that to know the meaning of a sentence is to know it's true truth conditions, the conditions in which it is true. And to know the meaning of other parts of speech is to know how they contribute to the truth conditions of a sentence. Uh, this idea perhaps goes back to Frege, but it's a very familiar idea in the philosophy of language. Now, a truth conditional semantics can take many different forms. I'm certainly not gonna discuss all of them, but the most prominent today is the so-called possible world semantics. Um, so it, under the possible world semantics, a truth maker is a possible world, some possible way, if you like, that the, the world could be. And um, a possible world well, there can then be a truth maker for a sentence if the sentence is, is true in that possible world. Um, so under this, uh, this version of, the tr of, uh, of a truth conditional semantics, uh, the meaning of a sentence, or the prop if you like, the proposition that it expresses, is the set of possible worlds in which it is true. Uh, and that gives uh, what's often be thought regarded as an intentional theory of meaning. The two sentences are going to have the same meaning or express the same proposition if they're true in the very same possible worlds. And in particular, if two sentences are, are, are logically equivalent, logic according to classical logic, uh, then in that special case, they'll also be true uh, in the same possible worlds and so have the same mean, meaning. So a uh, possible semantics doesn't distinguish in meaning between logically equivalent sentences. Okay. Now, we can regard truth maker semantics as both um, uh, a refinement and an extension of the possible world semantics. So one way of thinking of it is in the, is in the following way. Look, in the possible world semantics, we say, we may say uh, in attempting to determine the meaning of a sentence that it's true in these possible worlds and not in others. But when we say that the sentence is true in a possible world, we're not saying what it is in that possible world that makes it true. We're just saying the only information we have is that it's true in that world. We have no information at all about what, if anything, in the world um, makes it true. Okay. So under the possible world semantics, it is raining or it's not raining. And uh, it's 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 cold or not cold. Uh, we'll have the very same truth conditions. They'll be true in the same possible worlds, namely every possible world. But you might well think, well, look, there is a difference in meaning because in any possible world in which one of them is true, what makes it what makes it the sentence true is different in the two cases. In the case of it's raining or not raining, what makes it true is the presence or the absence of rain. Whereas um, what makes the, 
it is cold or it's not cold true is the presence or absence of, of cold. So if you look inside the world and see what makes it true, you'll see that these sentences have a, have a different meaning. Uh, so that's one way in which truth maker semantics is a refinement of possible semantics. Uh, there's another way in which it's an extension because we're not, uh, and this is actually, it took me a lot, it took me quite some time to appreciate this fact. Um, we're not just looking at possible truth makers, that is possible states of affairs, which we could regard as being part of a possible world. We also want to look at impossible states of affairs. So we want to say there may be truth makers for a sentence that actually are not possible states of affairs and that are not even part of any a possible, possible, possible world. Um, and there are, uh, uh, so this is a genuine extension of, 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 the, of, of the notion. Um, and there are various reasons to make that extension. One is that there, there are reasons for wanting every sentence to have a truth maker. So if a truth maker, uh, so if a sentence is impossible, there can be no possible state or state of affairs as truth maker, so you, have to need, you need an impossible state of affairs. Um, I sometimes think of this extension of the, of the field of truth makers to impossible truth makers as like the extension of the number field. Uh, so, you know, the normal way of measuring is with, well, counting using the integers, and then we measure with rationals, and then we have, we, we feel the need in order to solve various equations, have irrational numbers and so on. So it's, it's somewhat similar to that, that there's a need to have certain things, certain states, truth makers existing, uh, which may not be among the truth makers we originally admitted into our ontology. Now, what is, now there are other semantics uh, that also have these partial and impossible uh, truth makers. What's distinctive, as for example, in situations, uh, situation semantics, uh, uh, which was in its heyday in the late 60s, early 70s and so on, uh, also uh, allows for this kind of uh, framework. What's, dis what's most distinctive about truth maker semantics is that truth making is exact, what I call exact. That is a truth maker has to be relevant as a whole to the sentence that it makes true. Okay, so we can say that rain is a truth. The presence of rain is a truth maker of the sentence is raining or is not raining. But we wouldn't say that rain, the presence of rain and cold, is a truth maker, uh, because that state of, of affairs is not wholly relevant to the truth of the sentence. So, and I when this when a truth maker is wholly relevant, relevant as a whole. I say it's exact. So it's this feature of truth making that it's exact that's most distinctive, I think, about the, uh, the truth maker, what I call the truth maker approach. Okay. And uh, for a logician, uh, uh, it actually really goes against the grain uh, because when people have done this sort of semantics, they say, oh, well, if you've got a truth maker, then any extension of the truth maker should be a truth maker. And this gives you a nice mathematical theory. We're, we're very familiar with, it's called monotonicity or something. We're very familiar with that condition. Things are very nice when you have it. And so people I think, just almost out of habit assume that they would have this condition. Okay. Uh, but I think there's a great deal to be gained by, relax, by relaxing that condition and not, not insisting upon monotonicity. I guess the same has been, tr been true in, in, in the study of, of default reasoning. People, people naturally assume that there was a, a monotonicity condition. So if you added premises to an argument, they'd still be valid. And then people thought, well, maybe there's somebody who said for a notion of validity, which isn't, isn't the case. It goes against the grain, but uh, there's something to be said for it. And, and similarly, similarly in this case. Okay. okay, so that's a general introduction to the idea of, uh, of truth making. Uh, uh, so what I want to do now is uh, uh, just give um, uh, a sketch of how truth making smooth advances would apply to classical classical logic, okay, so, uh, and it, it, uh, it may, you may ha find it helpful to refer to the notes, but I, I I'm not sure that it would be essential for you to do that. Okay. Now, when you have a semantics, there's usually a pre-semantic setup. So even before you try to give meaning <laughs> uh, to your sentences or expressions of your language, there's some framework which you uh, ex employ in, in assigning that meaning. That's the pre-semantic setup. So in the case of possible world semantics, that consists of a, a pluriverse or a collection of possible worlds. Um, in the case of truth maker semantics, we, we, the pre-semantic setup has a little bit more structure. Uh, we have these things which, I, which we can call states. And for me, the term state is a term of art. It's whatever can serve 
as a truth maker. So they don't have to be states or, or states of affairs in any intuitive sense of the term. Okay. Um, but we need a convenient term for them. And so I call them states. Okay. And we need a little bit of st structure on these states. We, we, we need them to stand in relationships of part whole. So we want to be able to say that one state is part of another. So the present, if take the state which consists in the presence of cold, uh, of, of rain, that's part of the state that consists of the presence of rain and cold. So there's this relation of part whole among states. And for many purposes, and not for all purposes, we will need to exploit or take advantage of the distinction between possible states and impossible states. Okay. So we draw a line, so to speak, between the possible and the impossible states. Uh, actually, this, that, that distinct division among the states is not required for all of the applications. Uh, and this actually is a very interesting fact because uh, the possible world semantics presupposes this notion of possibility, presupposes us, as it were, in the very notion of a possible world that the, the that we're just we're dealing with this modal notion. Um, but there are many applications of truth maker semantics that don't require at all the modal notion, uh, but just require the merological notion. And actually, my view, I think, is that uh, the merological notion, the notion of part whole, is more fundamental for the understanding the basic logical relations than the modal notions. In fact, in truth maker semantics, as we'll see, uh, the um, the connectives are defined without reference to the notion of possibility. Possibility comes in another place. Okay. So this, to my mind, is a very interesting aspect of truth-making semantics, which, which, which comes out of the, way, of, 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 of the way you actually give, provide, state the clauses for the connectives. Um, now, um, so to make this formally precise, we define something which you might call the state space. So a state space consists of a set of states. These are the potential truth makers. Um, we might distinguish the possible states. So this will be a subset of those states. And uh, but there's a condition that we, it's natural to have, which is that if a state is possible, then any part of that state is also possible. In fact, that's the only condition on the possible states that we will require. Um, and it's also very natural that perhaps not necessary for all applications to assume that if we got any number of states, whatever, they'll, they'll have a fusion. We can put them together. Um, and mathematically speaking, we get what's called the least upper band. So this fusion will contain all the other states and it will be the least of the states to contain all the other states. So any other state that contains all the other states will contain this particular state. But just think of this, the fusion. So the fusion of the presence of rain and the presence of rain, a cold will be the presence of re cold rain. Um, so that's the idea of, of a state space. And uh, there's, I think there's, uh, I may need some defined notions. Um, uh, let, well, there's one in the, in, the, in the notes, which is just the idea of two states being compatible. So two states are compatible when their fusion is a possible state. Um, also, since every set of states has a fusion, there'll be, there'll be the fusion of the empty set of states, which is something I call the null state. Um, that state is, is a part uh, of, uh, of every state. And, and if you like, there's nothing that it takes for the null state to obtain. It, it, obtains, it obtains for free. Okay. There's also, actually, I'm not sure I'm gonna need it, the, the, which you might call the full state, which is a fusion of all states. And if there are incompatible states, then the, the fusion will itself will, will, be, will be an impossible state. It will be the, the biggest state and the, 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 the biggest, biggest impossibility. Um, okay, so let me state the clauses for uh, uh, a classical truth maker semantics. Uh, uh, and one way of thinking of it is as follows that Instead of asking, you know, when is a sentence true in a possible world, we're asking now when, when would a state in the possible world, or maybe even an impossible state, make the sentence true? And we want 
to understand that idea of making true exactly so that the state that makes the sentence true must be exactly or relevant as a whole to the sentence it makes true. And it turns out that we need what's sometimes called a bilateral semantics. That is a semantics that has clauses both for when a sentence is made true and also for when it's made false. Okay. And it actually turns out in this semantics that, uh, and actually this is of huge significance, I think. It turns out in this semantics, the two sentences can agree on their truth makers, uh, but disagree on their falsity makers. Um, so, and for that reason, uh, you have to give both truth, uh, you have to give clauses both on the side of truth making and on the side of falsity making. Okay. Um, now, I've listed these clauses under the heading classical TMS that are at the bottom of the page. Um, so, you have a model which assigns truth makers and falsity makers to the sentence letters of your language. Um, and then when it comes to um, a disjunction, a truth maker for a disjunction would be a truth maker for one of the disjuncts. So that's straightforward. But a truth maker for a conjunction will not be a truth maker for both con conjuncts, because that doesn't uh, that will not preserve uh, exactness. So um, a truth maker for it is re re raining coal would be the presence of rain and coal. But that's not an exact truth maker for each conjunct. <laughs> it's actually irrelevant. It's, it's truth maker for neither conjunct because it, it, it contains this irrelevant element. Okay. So what we say instead is that a truth maker for a conjunction is the fusion, is a fusion of truth makers for the conjuncts. That's what we say. Now, a falsity maker for a conjunction will be a falsity maker for one of the uh, conjuncts. And a falsity maker for disjunction will be a fusion of truth makers uh, for the disjuncts. Oh, oh, not of truth makers, of the falsity makers for the disjuncts. Okay. So those, those are the truth maker clauses for, um, for the connectives. Okay. Um, and um, there are two defined notions I should introduce, they'll be useful later. Uh, one is the idea of inexact truth making. So we can say that a state is an inexact truth maker for a sentence if it contains an exact truth maker. It has an exact truth maker as a part. So rain and cold is not an exact truth maker for the sentence, it is raining and it is cold, but it is, um, sorry, it's not an exact truth maker for the sentence, it is raining, but it is an inexact truth maker because it contains an exact truth maker, namely the presence, the presence of rain, okay. And another notion will need the notion of equivalence, where we say that we can say that two sentences are equivalent if they have the same truth makers. And in fact, there's no, we can have a stronger notion of equivalence where we can have full equivalence if they have the same truth makers and the same falsity makers. But uh, uh, for now, we can just be content with the notion of, of equivalence. Okay. So that, in a nutshell, uh, oh, there's, there's, uh, there's something else in the notes and I'm, I'm just going to avoid it. Um, when we're doing classical logic, we want to avoid certain situations. We want to avoid, for example, that uh, so, uh, some possible state might be a truth maker, both uh, for, um, uh, for, a, for a, and a falsity maker for a sentence, because then the sentence could be both true and false. Okay, so there are various conditions where we have to appeal to the uh, to this notion of a possible state uh, that we need to impose on on the truth and falsity makers and it's because we impose those conditions um, that we get classical logic without imposing those conditions there's actually no not even any way of defining the notion of a classical logical truth okay but I'm I, let, let me just uh, uh, leave, leave that okay okay um, so let me come to the hyper-intentional revolution. And I think it, maybe it was uh, Daniel Nolan who used this expression. And, and I, he talked about the hyper-intentional revolution in metaphysics. Uh, but I think it's, it's as much a revolution in the philosophy of language, if it is a revolution, it's as much a revolution in the, in, in the philosophy of language or in semantics. And of course, the two are connected because if you have some metaphysical concept, you may well express it in language. <laughs> Um, so they're really two sides of the, of the same coin. Um, 
So what 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 hypertension FE is, roughly speaking, is the idea that we might need for semantical or metaphysical purposes to distinguish between intentionally equivalent sentences, ones that are true in the same possible worlds. And it's it's very easy to see that the truth maker semantics is hyperintentional. Uh, this is on the second page, it's under the second line under the hyperintentional revolution. And so look at the two sentences A versus A or A and B. It's raining versus it's raining or it's raining and cold. Okay. They don't have the same truth makers because one of the truth makers for it's raining or it's raining and cold is the presence of rain and cold. That's an exact truth maker because it's a truth, uh, it's a, an exact truth maker of the second disjunct. And so a truth maker of the disjunction. But it's not a truth maker for the, for the first sentence, it is raining. Okay. So that's a very simple example of how two um, intentionally equivalent sentences are not going to be equivalent uh, in the, under the truth maker semantics. And that, that failure of, of equivalence is, is very significant in, in the application of the, uh, of the theory. Um, I mean, just to give you a sense, um, I can tell Johnny that he can have, have candy. Uh, I, he may have candy, or, or I may say he may have candy or candy and ice cream. Well, he'd much prefer me to say the latter because that gives him permission to have both, whereas the first doesn't give him permission to have both. Okay, so it looks as if now there's a difference between having candy on the one hand and having candy or candy and ice cream uh, on the other hand. So that's just one simple illustration of how that, uh, there can be a significant distinction between these two. Now, uh, philosophers of language uh, recognized, have recognized for a long time that there can be hyperintentionality. Um, so they recognize, for example, the belief, many of them, some, some still resist actually, but <laughs> many of them have recognized that, for example, belief context uh, can be hyperintentional. So you can believe that Hesperus is phosphorus, but not believe that Hesperus is phosphorus. Okay. But what they thought is that when there is hyperintentionality, it arises from the way the proposition in question is presented. Okay, so it's the difference. It, there's a difference in that. So this is certainly Frege's view. The, the, the reason why we have opacity in these belief contexts is because of a difference in sense, because of the way the reference is presented. So they, they've always thought that that difference is a difference in the way something, which is what you're really talking about, is, is presented. Um, uh, so if you like, it's, it's presentation from above. We, we go into this sort of, we go higher up. <laughs> uh, and, and so we're looking down at, at what's of interest to us. And it seems to me that the source of hyperintentionality when it comes to truth makers semantics is completely different. It's not to do with how something in the world is, rep is represented. It's to do with how this thing of interest to the proposition is realized, what it is in the world that realizes a proposition. So we may have a possible world's proposition, which is the same in the case of A versus A or A and not, and A or A and B. But how that, prop, how that thing gets realized, what it is in the world that makes it true, how it gets realized, what's that really down there doing the work is different in the two cases. So whereas before we were thinking of hyperintentionality in terms of presentation from above, now we're thinking of hyperintentionality as arising from realization from below. Uh, there are finer distinctions in the world that need to be taken into account. And it's taken into account, account simply at the a more basic level of meaning. Okay. Now, so as I say, the, the source uh, of the hyperintentionality is quite different. And that means that the way it arises, the context in which it arises is quite different because whereas you might think the first kind of hyperintentionality which has to do with the presentation from above will arise when rep in these in case of propositional attitudes or mental, at mental attitudes where, where, where the way the world is presented to us is significant. We would expect hyperintentionality of the second sort 
to arise in more objective contexts, where the representation is not in question, but where actually the relationship to the world is what is in question. Uh, and it seems to me it's that shift in perspective that makes this other source of hyperintentionality so, 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 so interesting. Now, you may ask, well, why should we care about this more fine-grained uh, notion of content? Why should we worry about the different ways the same proposition from another point of view can be realized? Okay. Uh, and I, I think actually to grasp this is really to grasp the significance of truth maker semantics. The reason is this, that often the truth makers or the way the intentional proposition gets realized, the realizations, are what matter to us. Okay. We're not interested in these propositions at this higher level, but in something more basic in the world that makes these propositions true. So um, uh, let me give a couple of illustrations of this. One is with permission when I permit someone to do something. What I'm interested in there are the particular actions that are permitted the particular actions. I'm not interested in certain, the truth of certain propositions being permitted. I'm interested in what I'm allowed to do. Or again, in the case of counterfactuals, often the interest is not in just some counterfactual consequences, some arbitrary truth, but in the, count, in the counterfactual consequences of particular events. That's where our interest is focused. Okay. Now, the fact of the matter is that if you have an intentional proposition, you often cannot tell from the intentional proposition what those particular facts are. It's impossible to say. This is a very significant fact, which means that you cannot even interpret the relevant notions. So a very, this can be illustrated in a very dramatic fashion by uh, an example which I call infinite Eden. Many of you may not know this. There's a garden of Eden, but there was another garden. Of course, it has a famous apple in it, but there was another garden that had infinitely many apples in it next door. And um, God said to, this is the case of mission, God said to Eve, you, you may eat infinitely many apples from infinite Eden. And uh, Eve went ahead and ate the forbidden fruit. That's why, actually, that's why she did it. No one ever said this, but anyway, she, and God said, what, 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 what are you doing? And she said, well, look, you permitted me, you talked to the proposition. What you permitted is the proposition that I eat infinite many apples from um, uh, infinite Eden. But the proposition that I eat infinite many apples from infinite Eden is necessarily equivalent to the proposition that I eat infinite many apples from infinite Eden or Eden. Because if I eat infinite many apples from infinite Eden, I eat infinite many apples from infinite Eden or Eden, because I can only eat one apple from Eden. And if, certainly if I eat infinite many apples from Eden or infinite Eden, then since there's only one apple in Eden, I, I will have eaten infinite many apples. So these two are necessarily equivalent. And don't you know that we can always substitute, always substitute intentional equivalence? So in effect, you permitted me to, uh, to eat infinite many apples from Eden or infinite Eden. Well, at this point, God would give uh, Eve an exercise in uh, the fact that permi permission is a, a, a hyper-intentional operator. The fact is, if I just tell you these possible worlds, these are the possible worlds in which I eat infinitely many apples in infinite Eden. If that's all I have, just those worlds, I can't tell you, I can't say that this, this, that this proposition concerns the apple. There's nothing in that proposition that tells me that this proposition concerns the apples in infinite Eden as opposed to the, as the apples in infinite Eden or Eden. There's nothing, there's nothing you can, there's some impossible to, to tell. Okay. So this is a case in which we take, if you take the intentional view, you permission statements can't even perform the basic function of being a guide to action. And the similar point holds in regard to counterfactuals. Suppose it, Eve's on her best behavior and doesn't in fact eat any of the apples. And I can ask, well, what if she had eaten infinite many apples from 
uh, infinite Eden. Might she have eaten um, an apple from, from Eden? Well, no, you say. But, uh, but that proposition that she had infinitely many apples from infinite Eden is equivalent to her eating infinitely many apples from infinite Eden or Eden. So in that case, I formulated that way, I should have said yes. So if I'm considering that counterfactual, I ask, well, what changes in the world am I envisaging? Then again, I cannot say. I just don't, it's impossible properly. This is, I really need to emphasize, it's impossible properly to interpret what you're saying. Uh, there's a further point to be made, which is this. Um, often, even if we know how to interpret the sentence, we want to be able to explicitly indicate its meaning in terms of these more basic facts, in the facts concerning the realizers of the proposition. Uh, and what that in effect means is that we actually want to be able to compute what the meaning is in these other terms. Uh, so from a logical point of view, that, that's equivalent to having a normal form theory, theorem. Every, you want every sentence to be equivalent to a certain kind of normal form from which you can read off. Uh, how, uh, what, the, what, the, what the relevant connections are among the actual truth makers. Uh, let, let me give a simple example. We all, we all know about truth tables. So if you've got a formula of classical sentential logic, it's truth value, we turn on the truth value of the component sentences. So that's the bottom what's involved, the truth value of the component sentences. But that's different from there, but actually now explicitly state in the object language, how that is the case. If I just had material conditional in my language, that's the only thing I had, I wouldn't be able to explain using that, simply that connective, I wouldn't be able to say how that translates into, into truth conditions. Um, but so if I, if I have or and and not, or I just guys guess I need, I guess, well, actually, yeah. Now I can give a disjunctive normal form. I can say every sentence is equivalent to a disjunction of state descriptions where the state description is a conjunction of atomic sentences or negations. And now I can, given that this, I can, I can compute the normal form, I can read off the truth table. Okay. And from a, uh, uh, the point of view, we had to use these symbolisms. It's very helpful to have something like a normal form there. So that's something else we might might have. I'll I'll come I'll come back to this point. Okay. All right. So I just wanted to say something about the what hyper intentional revolution was and why I regard it as significant. And what I want to do now is to consider some applications in the light of this hyper intentionality. Um, uh, I was, I was told that there are linguists and logicians and philosophers here, and I wanted to give an ex example that might have some interest to all, each of these groups. I, I don't know if we're gonna have time, so we'll, we'll, just, we'll just see how it goes, okay. Uh, so my first example is with, is with counterfactuals. Okay. Um, now, I, I seem to remember that Daniel Nolan in his paper on the hypertextual revolution says, you know, we need to uh, take into account counter possible, such as counterfactuals, impossible antecedents. But even without considering that case, we need to have a hyper intentional view of counterfactuals, it seems to me. Um, and so uh, I, I'm actually now just giving a thumbnail sketch of, of, of a truth maker semantics for counterfactuals that uh, I've suggested. Um, and the idea is this that we add. Let's suppose we just fix, we fix on the actual world. So I'm just concerned with what's true or true in the actual world. And the idea is then we have a transition relation uh, among the states. So here's the world. And then I take a state and I imagine me myself imposing that state on the world and saying that I need to change the world so that state holds. Uh, that will result in some other changes. Maybe not a, 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 a determinate change, but maybe a range of different. There may be a range of different possible changes that will result. So then, in that case, I want to say that the initial state transitions into one or other of these other states. So we have this transition relation, which is a relation between states, meaning that um, 
when S transitions to, to T, that means T is a possible outcome of making the of opposing state S on the world. Okay. Um, and now we can give a, a, a truth maker semantics uh, for the counterfactual. We'll say that the counterfactual, if A were to be the case and C would be the case, is true. If you is in the following, ca the following case, if you were to take any truth maker for A and look at any state to which it transitions, look at any possible outcome of that truth maker, then it would be an inexact truth maker for C. So both the notions of exact and inexact truth maker are involved here. I'm saying any exact truth maker for A will transition always to an inexact truth maker for C. Okay. So take if the match were, to, were struck, it would, it would light. Here the state, the truth maker that the match would struck is that is the striking of the match. There may be one or more outcomes of this, depends on whether the universe is deterministic. Uh, and we say the counterfactual is true. And for all those outcomes, will include as a part uh, um, an exact truth maker for, for the match, match lighting. So that, that, that is a, a truth maker semantics for the counterfactual, which relies critically on this idea of the, of the tr of truth, exact truth makers for the antecedent and, and the consequent. Um, so we're actually uh, uh, piggybacking on the truth maker semantics we already have. Okay. So um, one thing that's, that's nice about this is that it immediately saw, it's built into the semantics what the particular facts are that are relevant to the evaluation of the counterfactual. So it immediately solves the problem that we had over infinite Eden. Because if the antecedent is uh, Eve uh, eats this infinite bunch of apples or that infinite bunch of apples, blah, 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 all, all always from infinite Eden, the, then, then, then things will be fine. God's not going to punish them. Then things will be fine. Um, then things would be fine. Um, now, the way we evaluate that is we look, that we, the, the antecedent is now in effect a disjunction. She eats, eats this infinite bunch of apples from infinite Eden or that bunch. So a truth maker will just be her eating infinite bunch of apples from infinite Eden. And of course, the outcome of that is that the God is not, not displeased. Okay. Now, if, if uh, the antecedent with this logical equivalent or necessary equivalent antecedent that she eats an infinite number of apples from uh, Eden or infinite Eden, then among the disjuncts would be her, her eating an infinite many apples, including the apple from Eden. Okay. And so we'd have to consider what would happen then. And of course, if, if they wish she were to do that, God would be severely displeased. Um, so we actually are distinguishing between these two antecedents, which are intentionally equivalent in terms of the truth makers. And in that way, we avoid, avoid the problem of infinite Eden. Okay. Uh, let me, uh, 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 there's a very significant application, I think, of this, uh, of this approach, uh, which is made in a paper by Ray Briggs, though it's, it's also mentioned in uh, a, a paper I wrote uh, as well, but, the, but not discussed in any detail. Uh, some of you may know about causal modeling. So this is in the, in the style of Judea Pearl. Uh, so the idea is to have some variables and the value of one variable may depend upon the value of other variables. So we have some equations to indicate how the value of one variable may depend upon the value of, of another variable. Uh, and then if you've got a bunch of equations of this sort, um, you can explain, you can give what's called an interventionist interpretation of counterfactuals. You can say, well, look, this is how things, these are the values the variables have. Uh, now, what if I were to change, intervene and change the value of this variable? Uh, how would the var values of the other variables change? Okay, and you can give it a very natural rule to do this. Basically, you don't look back and you do look and you look forward, <laughs> okay? So if, if I change the value of this variable, and this, this variable depended through equation on other, on other variables. So I, I leave those alone. 
But if there's some variables that depend on this variable, then I change them accordingly. Okay, that's the, ba that's the basic idea. There are some quirks, but anyway, that's the basic idea. Now, that semantics only tells you, only tells you what the counterfactual consequences would be of changing the values of certain variables. But if you had a logically complex antecedent in the counterfactual, it doesn't tell you at all what the, what, how to evaluate that counterfactual. Okay. So this is a case where we have, as it were, the primordial counterfactuals, which concern very particular events in the world or particular changes. But we don't know how to evaluate a counterfactual that contains an arbitrary proposition. Now, what you can do is uh, you define a transition relation. Basically, that interventionist semantics gives you a transition relation. It tells you whenever you have a, a one state, which consists of, a, of a ch specifying a, the values of the variables, it tells you what the outcome will be. And then you can use the clauses in the truth maker. You can use the clauses in the truth maker semantics to evaluate arbitrary counterfactuals. Okay, so uh, the truth maker semantics is just ready-made, so to speak, for extending the semantics uh, to the more general general case. Now, one actually nice feature of this is we also get a kind of normal form. So um, many counterfactuals uh, will not be of this primordial sort saying, oh, if you change these variables to these, if you change the values of these variables, then the, you'll get this change, blah, 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 blah. Uh, they'll often be very complex. They may have embedded counterfactuals and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and what you can do is show that you can actually get a reduction to, to, to sort of um, a, to the counterfactual of these primordial forms. So it's a kind of normal form theorem. Um, and this puts certain principles, it puts them in a very different light. So one principle is simplification. So this is the principle that says, the, count, the counterfactual, if A or B, then C, is equivalent to the counterfactual, the conjunction of two counterfactuals, if A, then C, and if B, then C. If Johnny were to eat candy or ice cream, then he would be sick. That's meant to be, a, that should be equivalent according to this principle, that Johnny would eat candy, he would be sick, and if Johnny were to eat ice cream, he would be sick. That principle is denied under the usual possible world. Oh, semantics okay but it, it's actually trivially true under the, um, the truth maker semantics um, so many people think oh well uh, battle of intuitions here maybe there's a pragmatic explanation and so so forth you know you've given a semantic explanation but you know we can perhaps explain in some other way why you're inclined to think the principle is is correct but the point i want to emphasize is forget all that <laughs> This principle is playing a very important role, a very important role, which is enabling us to get a normal form. It's enabling us to simplify when a counterfactual, to tell us explicitly when the counterfactual is true. Because we've got this disjunctive antecedent and we now just got a, the disjuncts. Okay. So it's like uh, having a normal form in sentential logic. Okay. Uh, and similarly with some of the so-called import export rule, the counterfactual if A were to be the case and if B were to be the case and C would be the case. Do you want that to be equivalent if A and B were to be the case and C would be the case? Again, that affects a, sim a, a reduction, a reduction. So we could see at the end of the day that the tr explicitly that the truth like all counterfactuals is just going to depend upon these very basic counterfactuals. All right, so um, that is uh, one of the applications. Um, Maybe I'll only have time for the uh, one other application. Uh, I have two in here. One is to intuitionistic logic, which is meant to be for the logicians, and the other is for deontic updating, which is, I guess, partly for the linguists, I don't know, but also for the philosophers. Anyway, let's do let's do deontic updating. Okay, so we're going to do a little bit of uh, deontic logic. Um, so there's a standard possible world semantics for deontic logic. So um, basically, permission is treated like diamond, like a possibility operator, and obligation is treated like box, like a necessity operator. And so the thought is we have this set of ideal worlds, a worlds in which all obligations are met. Uh, and then uh, uh, phi, uh, proposition phi is permissible if it's true in one of those worlds. 
Uh, and phi is uh, obligatory if it's uh, if it's true. In, sorry, that's actually true. Uh, phi is permitted if phi is true in some in some 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 of those worlds, and phi is obligatory if it's true in all of those worlds. Um, the truth maker semantics for permission and obligation is very different. Um, so what, instead of a set of ideal worlds, we have what I call a code of conduct. So a code of conduct, uh, and now I'm, I'm imagining now that it's uh, actions uh, uh, that are in question here. So actions that have been permitted or, or, or made, said to be obligatory. Uh, and of course, you can fuse actions. You have a whole bunch of actions. And then you get what you might call a course of action. Uh, uh, and a code is a set of courses of action, um, which are ideal in the sense that they're, first of all, that they're permitted. <laughs> and the secondly, that that course, the courses of action which you fulfill all your obligations. So they're permitted. An ideal course of action will be permitted. And uh, it'll be one also in which you, you meet all your obligations. Of course, you could you could have one without the other. You could uh, it could be permitted, but it may it may be you, there are certain obligations you, you you're fulfilling. You could fulfill all your obligations, but still do something uh, that's not permitted. You so you're not not a completely good boy. Um, all right, so uh, so that's, that's 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 a code of conduct. So it corresponds to this set of ideal worlds, uh, and then we can say that um, an action is permitted if there's some ideal course of action that contains it as a part. Okay, and we can say an action is obligatory if every ideal course of action contains it as a part. Okay. Um, so, uh, now, there's this big problem updating problem, which I think was first raised by, uh, but by Lewis. And although I'm going to be talking about deontic updating, there are very similar issues for other kinds of updating, for example, with, the, with belief revision. Okay, so uh, a lot of what I'm going to say will apply to belief revision. And, and, uh, and some of us have actually been working on this, on the truth maker approach to the belief revision. And I should say that I wrote briefly on uh, deontic updating and um, uh, Daniel Rothschild and Steve Yablo have a more recent but unpublished paper on uh, deontic updating, which is which is sort of in line with what what I'm going to be saying. Okay. Now, in the possible worlds framework, so what I can, this is what what's what's the, what's deontic updating? Well, you know, I'm under certain obligations, and uh, you know, and then I might say, you know, well, you you meant to work every day of the week, and I say you can take Mondays off. I say that, you know. I mean, I'm in a good mood. You can take Mondays off. Uh, what now am I permitted to do? In other words, I so we think of it in terms of this set of ideal worlds. Somehow that set must change. <laughs> Before that, that set didn't contain any worlds in which I took Monday off, but now it must conclude worlds in which I took uh, Monday off. But which worlds? The worlds in which I take Monday off and kill you? Uh, um, the worlds in which I take every day off? No, but which worlds? Okay. Well, if you just look at the semantics for the deontic operators in the possible framework, there's nothing sensible you can say. There's nothing sensible you can say. There's, there's no way of distinguishing the good worlds that you are now permitted to, to bring about as opposed to the bad worlds. Simply no way to do it. Okay, so this looks like a very big problem. Um, this is not a problem, or at least such a problem, for the truth maker framework. Okay, uh, because we can say this: Look, we have these ideal courses of action. Okay, and maybe all of them have you working every day of the week, Monday to Friday. Okay. Uh, now I say you may take Monday off. What, what does that mean? Well, actually, you could still work every day of the week if you want to. I only gave you, didn't say you had to take Monday off. So you know, if you wanted, you could work on Monday. 
Um, but also, what you usually what you want to say is, well, look, I can work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, but and then just forget and forget about Monday. Take Monday off. Okay. But now we can explain what that involves because what we're doing is we're looking at that state or action in which you take Monday off. And we're looking at the, and now we're looking at the largest part of this other state, which you work every day of the week, and looking at the largest part of that, which is compatible with taking Monday off. So if you like, I'm subtracting taking Monday off from the state in which I work every day of the week. And then I get the state in which I work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and, and don't, don't work on Monday. So uh, we can actually define, define, uh, Within the, the actually, this is the case where the meriology is doing some work. We're pinning to these relations apart, all and subtracting and so on. So, the fact is, we now have the, the technology to define this the idea of subtracting one state from another. Okay, and that's uh, that's already there in the semantics, and in this way, we can define the ontic updating. Okay, so um, what I also wanted to say, and, and uh, let me just briefly mention this, is that. Again, we can solve the problem of infinite Eden uh, because what uh, Eve is permitted to do in one case is to eat infinite many apples from inf infinite Eden. And of course that just means she's permitted to uh, perform one of these disjunct acts, actions, which wouldn't include her eating the, the forbidden fruit. Uh, it's also possible, and this is actually a, a much more difficult question, is, is um, to, to prove some kind of normal form theorem. Uh, it's especially difficult, and I only have an unpub unpublished work on this, to do this when we also in have conditional obligation, conditional permission. Uh, so we don't, don't say, say you simply say you're obliged to do this or permitted to do that, but obliged under these circumstances or permitted under those circumstances. Okay. But so something similar can be done in those cases. So I'm gonna miss, miss, miss out, uh, I since I'm sort of, uh, really used up my time. I'm gonna miss out the, inter the application to inter interesting logic. Uh, but let, I wanna emphasize that um, these are just two of many applications of truth maker semantics that have been made. Uh, applications to ground, for example, to verisimilitude. Uh, people have actually also started to apply it to, to prob prob questions of probability. Uh, mm. Uh, I've, I've looked at the uh, is all problem in this in this in this connection and um, many other. So it, I think many many people uh, have the sense that that, 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 that that this is is actually a really quite useful technology that you can use in in, 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 try, in trying to gain a better understanding of various notions concepts of philosophical interest. Uh, and with those remarks, I, I will end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fine. Um, so th there are lots of lots of questions streaming in from the audience. Um, I'll 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 look at those and 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 choose some for Professor Fine to to well uh, choose uh, choose, choose choose the easy ones, okay? Yeah, I'll choose the easy ones. <laughs> but I thought <laughs> no, for sure. <laughs> Uh, before before I want before doing that, I wanted to just introduce our main panelist. Actually, um, it's, so it's my honor and great pleasure to present our um, Michael J. Raven to give the first questions. He's associate professor at the at the University of Victoria in British Columbia and affiliate associate professor in philosophy at the University of Washington. And besides writing uh, the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry about Kit Fine. Is also after Professor Fine one of the leading uh, experts on grounding and essence, and he's edited the Rut the Rutledge handbooks for both of these topics and published more than thirty four articles on these and other uh, topics in the in some of the best journals in our field, including in defense of ground in the Australasian Journal of Philosophy, explaining essence is forthcoming in Phil Studies and is logic out of this world forthcoming in the Journal of Philosophy. Um, welcome, Mike, to, to ask uh, uh, Kip Fine some, some questions. 
Well, thank you. I'm, it's a privilege and an honor to uh, be allowed to ask a question. Um, given the uh, uh, occasion, I thought it would be appropriate to uh, attempt to uh, relate some of uh, Fine's work to uh, Russell's work. Uh, and and uh, uh, Kit, you mentioned the uh, philosophy of logical atomism. Of course, uh, Russell wrote early on there that uh, he nearly produced a riot at Harvard when he argued that there were no, uh, or that rather that there were negative facts. And even though this is a virtual session, I have no desire to incite a riot. So I'm not gonna ask that question, but I do wanna ask a, a, another question about a, a sort of fact that uh, Russell was infamous for arguing in defense of. And this was a uh, general facts. Uh, he of course thought that in addition to atomic facts, there were uh, general facts and uh, uh, Fine himself in extensions of truth maker semantics to uh, the quantifiers has likewise expressed uh, sympathy for uh, totality facts. Uh, and this raises uh, various uh, questions. So um, on the metaphysical side, there are questions of uh, you know, what a totality fact is and uh, what if anything might, might ground them. Um, on the semantical side, there's the question of how to properly amend the quantificational clauses to, to you know, put them to work. Uh, um, now, Fine has suggested a methodology in which we can compartmentalize these uh, questions. So uh, we may, if you like, quarantine the metaphysical questions about the totality facts when our purposes are just strictly semantical. And uh, I think overall, this is a very wise methodology. And I suspect that you know, breaking proper quarantine is a source of endless confusions. Uh, nevertheless, you know, there, there are instances where considerations sort of specific to the case might, might call the quarantine measures into, into, into doubt. And uh, one might wonder whether totality facts are such a case. So um, I just have a few thoughts about totality facts in particular, and also about the methodology of excuse me, compartmentalization in general, and wanted just to invite, uh, find to reflect on them. So just where I'm coming from, um, the unamended semantic clauses, uh, such as the ones in the handout, um, are you know, neutral over the internal structures of the truth or false making uh, states except in so far as those states uh, are to be regarded as uh, myriological fusions of others. Um, by contrast, it's perhaps somewhat less clear whether this neutrality really e extends to a, a totality fact. Um, after all, you know, a, a totality fact can't just be a fusion of the instances of a generalization, otherwise that would seem to make it redundant. Um, there's no point in adding it then. And uh, it's unclear what other myriological structure it, it might have. Um, on the other hand, we don't seem to want to say that there's no internal structure because then this makes it difficult perhaps to distinguish between uh, the totality factor state uh, from the non-totality facts, except for its special appearance in the, the quantificational clauses themselves. So I wanted to ask, uh, may we reasonably ignore these sorts of considerations when our purposes are just strictly semantical? Um, and if not, is there more to be said about totality facts sort of on the semantical side strictly? Or do we need to sort of break quarantine and uh, engage with the, uh, the metaphysics of a totality fact um, eventually? Um, that's a great, great question. Um, um, uh, I, I don't know whether you need to break the quarantine or not, but it would perhaps be like Governor Newsom, you know, that it's just a very mild uh, violation of quarantine. Or so, so one would like to think. Okay. Um, I, mean, I know if my, my Chinese audience will understand that reference, but anyway. Um, the, um, so, uh, I guess my general position would be this. Um, when we're doing the semantics for the quantifiers, uh, what, 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 we'll say something like this, that uh, uh, suppose we had unrelativized quantifiers, so we say for all x, phi of x. Um, and what will make this true is, is a totality fact that's indexed to a subset j of individuals. So in, a, in effect, that totality fact is saying j are exactly the individuals that there are. And then that will be fused with the relevant in truth makers for the relevant in instances of, of, of phi. Uh, um, so for each for each particular individual in that set J, um, we'll want to have a truth maker 
for the fact that the J phi's, and then we want to fuse all those truth makers. Okay, um, so that actually will be the general form of the clause. Now, um, the um, the question now, it's not a question now is, if we are to get the logical truths that we want, what conditions do we need to impose on these totality facts? So, so in a, if we're actually dealing with classical logic, uh, a natural condition is this, that if you've got a totality fact for J and a totality fact for J prime, where J and J prime are, are distinct sets, they should be incompatible. So it can't be true both that these, this set of individuals is exactly the individuals there are, and also that other set is. Uh, you know, I haven't actually done the hard work of determining exactly what those conditions would be. But what I'd like is that um, it, it would be certain semantic, this is in a, this general idea of division of labor. So it's just going to be the semantics that will lead you to uh, adopt certain constraints on what the totality facts, facts are. Um, uh, and not any metaphysical considerations. Um, uh, and I suspect those constraints will be basically modal constraints. So although you may well think, look, uh, well, you might ask, you know, well, um, are there merological relations between these totality facts and uh, other facts? And probably this, probably, I'm not sure about this, probably the semantics could remain neutral on the question, it will make no difference to the logic. So even though you might well think, you know, well, there are some moral merological facts to the matter, uh, probably for semantical purpose. Well, I don't know. Again, this is all conjectural. Okay, but um, uh, now let me just say on the metaphysical side, I actually think that's a very serious problem. Uh, what, what it is that grounds universal statements? Uh, so I don't take that question at all, at all lightly. Um, so that's part of the reason why I'd want to avoid it for the purposes of doing semantics. <laughs> okay, um, great, thank you. Um, I th um, uh, one of our other panelists, Julius Schoenherr, a colleague at uh, Peking University has, has, has a question as well. Um, Julius. Yeah, thank you, um, and ah, hi. Well, thank you, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a rather big picture question. Um, in the beginning, you said that the approach is kind of meant to extend possible worlds framework, um, basically as I understood it, because it's not fine grained enough um, to capture some uh, of the truths uh, of sentences. And, but then later on, it seemed like you, you seem to you, you seem to suggest that um, it's kind of meant as a replacement for uh, for possible worlds a framework. For example, when you talked about deontic uh, deontic logic, it seemed like a possible worlds framework has to go for ideal strings of actions, for example. And then uh, secondly, with regard to Frege, it seemed to me that you were suggesting that there's some that there's some truths where we want this bottom-up approach, where we want to know what the things in the world are that makes these things true, but Frege might still have something true to say about a whole range of other cases where we want this top-down kind of approach. So the question is, what's the intended scope um, of your approach? Is it supposed to replace ultimately um, possible world semantics, or is it supposed to um, um, is it supposed to just add on to it, fine grain it a little bit? Okay, uh, thank you. It's uh, a very interesting question. Uh, so when I made these remarks about truth maker semantics, uh, refining and extending um, possible semantics, what I had in mind is 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 the conception of truth making was both a refinement and an extension. I wasn't talking about truth maker semantics as a whole. Um, so um, I actually think that there may be certain applications, I'm not exactly sure what they are, but <laughs> where the possible semantics is fine. So you don't need to make these, these various distinctions. I mean, it's, possible semantics has been a tremendous, tremendous success. We don't want to overturn everything that's done. Um, 
but it, uh, when it when there are these problems, um, it may well be that I'd like to think of truth maker semantics as um, uh, as an alternative to the possible semantics. So we really are, uh, for example, given quite different clauses for the deontic operators um, or the counterfactual. So in those cases, it's 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 actually generally it's an alternative. Now. Very interesting question as to how you might combine this bottom up uh, uh, form of hyperintentionality with the top down. Uh, and I really haven't thought about that. Um, so basically, um, um, yeah. Um, so, so here's an example. I mean, I, I, I have this view of semantic relationism, so that um, maybe that's an aspect of top down. So, um, so like for me, um, um, Hesperus and Bosphorus uh, are co-referential, but they don't stand, they're not strictly co-referential uh, in a certain sense. Um, so that's actually a representational difference of a certain sort. So they're both ref directly refer to the very same object. Um, uh, how you would combine semantic relations with truth making semantics is something that I haven't really thought about. So, but that's a very interesting question as to how uh, this more Frigian or quasi Frigian view of hyperintentionality might combine with this uh, with other view. Um, and I, I really don't, I don't have any considered thoughts on, the, on that, on the topic, I'm afraid. Thank you. Um, okay, there, there's a whole stream of questions. And um, I saw that there were a couple of similar questions about, um, about the application of truth maker semantics to, to, to modals and, and modal logic and so possibility and necessity. Um, I guess they were, they're just kind of vague questions to potentially say more about how you think that um, possibility and necessity can be captured with the truth maker semantics. Would, would, would you like to do that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so actually, you know, I said, you, you know, possible semantics is good for certain things. And when, one of the things you might think it's good for is, is modal logic. Uh, but actually there's some, there's, there's, there's some doubt about that. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I say this semi facetiously because, you know, <laughs> classical modal logic done in the possible framework is, is, is a great thing. Um, but there is a use of these modal expressions um, to which the standard possible semantics isn't, doesn't apply. And this has to do with this idea of free choice. If I say Mary may be in Paris or Frankfurt, uh, that seems to might sorry might be might be uh, that uh, uh, that seems to imply that she might be in Paris and that she might be in Frankfurt and of course uh, the possible semantics doesn't have that uh, that implication. Um, um, or again, if I say that, that uh, her being in uh, Frankfurt or Paris is compatible. Uh, with uh, um, her being late for the meeting, uh, being, being on time for the meeting, let's say, uh, that that would naturally be taken to imply that it, sh it should be both both those possibilities that she's in Paris and that she's in Frankfurt should be compatible. Whereas again, that's not a prediction that would be made. So insofar as our interest in possibilities is, is an interest in the possibility of particular facts, uh, Standard modal logic is not adequate for the very same reasons that standard deontic logic isn't adequate. So, so that's a case. Uh, that's a case in point. Uh, another way, uh, um, even even when the possible semantics may be adequate, uh, that is not give you the incorrect logic. It may be inadequate in another way, and that is not informative enough. Okay, so. 
There is this project which I call exactification, and that is if you've got a semantics that isn't exact, it might be possible with semantics. You can always ask, well, I want a bit more information. I want to know what it is in the world that's doing this work, that's making the thing true. Okay. And possible semantics says, look, diamond P is true of the world. Let's accept this. If P is true, it's impossible. But then what it, is it about the, clearly not everything about that world is, is bears on, on this. So what is it about the world that makes it true that P is possible? Okay. So we want to know what a, a relevant truth maker is. Okay. And a truth maker semantics can provide an answer to that. Uh, and this is what they call the exactification of the semantics. So it's not that you're saying the other semantics is wrong, but the other semantics is telling us what the inexact truth makers are. And what we want to know is what the underlying exact truth makers are. And that gives us more information. Actually, that's actually relevant to what I was going to say about intuitionistic logic, because there's Kripke semantics for intuitionistic logic. And um, you can exactify that. You can say, well, Kripke has this idea that a condition or a piece of information forces or makes true a sentence. And then, but then you can ask, well, that piece of information may contain a great deal that's irrelevant. So what, what is it in the piece of information? And when you ask, push on that question, you can, you can get an underlying exact semantics that's very like what's called the BHK semantics, the brow heighting Kolmogorov semantics, which is done in terms of proofs. Uh, so what you can say is uh, in, the un under, in the underbelly, so to speak, of the Kripke semantics is something like um, this BHK semantics. Uh, and that's much more informative about what's going on. Okay. Um, so we would like to, and no one's, I don't think anyone's really tackled this. Uh, a number of people have gone it, but to try to give a more informative semantics, for example, for, for, for regular mode logic, even if, even if you accept the normal possible semantics. Um, great. Um, I think there's a kind of potentially a, a follow up to this where, um, one of the PhD students here actually asked a question about, so he, he asked, is the possible world semantics derivable from the truth maker semantics or a fragment of the latter to sketch the uh, truth making content of a proposition in the world? Do we need a function to specify all the truth makers in that world? Since there could be many exact truth makers in one world, like a, a lot of dogs could make there is a, Sorry, there can is you a dog just can you read can you can you read the second half of that question again? Because I I think uh, I didn't quite get it. Uh, I got the first half. Okay. Whether whether it's a special, yeah. Yeah. The, read, the, the, basically, the, the, yeah, the relationship between them, whether it's derivable, and the second part is to okay, sketch sure. the truth making content of a proposition in a possible world. Do we need a special function to specify all the truth makers in the world? So is there a special function that gets oh. us? The der derivation. Okay, so uh, let me first of all address the, the first question. I, I may be that I haven't fully understood the question. Um, yeah. po the possible semantics can be seen as a special case of the truth maker semantics. Um, and because you could imagine that uh, the only truth makers are the possible worlds. So they're not going to stand in any merological relationships with one to the other. Now, we do need this condition that ev every every set of states has a fusion. So the empty set of states has to have a fusion. That would be a null state that lies, that is a part of every one of these possible worlds. And there also has to be a fusion. Uh, uh, there has to be a, a, a thing at the top, which is the, impos the impossible world. So we have a kind of diamond structure of all these possible worlds. Uh, you have this thing at the bottom, which is the null state. You have this thing at the top, which is the false state. And if you do a truth maker semantics with the, in that structure, it's essentially the same as the possible semantics. That's a very special case where the, if the underlying state space has that structure, that's, that's, that essentially gives you the, uh, the possible world, possible world semantics. Okay. Now, there's another question, which is this. If you've, uh, can we incorporate possible worlds into the state space? Okay, and you can, you get then, you then get what I call the W space. So we can define a world state, that's a possible world, as a state that's possible, max, that's maximally possible. So it's possible, and it's not a proper part of any other possible state. So those, those, those are the worlds, okay. And then 
I, I say a, 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 a W space is one which is such that every possible state is contained in a world state. So it can always be extended. Okay, that's a very strong assumption, but you can make that assumption. Um, and then for some purposes, it's helpful to work within, within a W space. I try to avoid it as far as possible. I, it seems like a very strong assumption to me that is to be avoided if you can. Um, now, the third aspect is if you're working within a W space, you might be interested in this notion, which is kind of a hybrid notion. And uh, maybe the, 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 the question was getting at this. Might you think not just of this state being a truth maker for this sentence, but of this state in this world. So we bring in both the state and the world. This is it's the state in this world that's a truth maker. Okay. Uh, and I've sometimes been tempted by that. And for some reason, I don't really like it. And uh, I've tried to avoid it. I don't, I, but there, that, there's a very interesting question as to whether we have any need of a notion of that sort. Uh, and maybe the, the, the question was getting at something like that um, in their question. So we have a kind of a double indexing. It's a two dimensional mm -hmm. sem semantics, if you like, where we evaluate sense it's relative to a state and a world. Um, and intuitively we're thinking that, that it's, it's the, the sentence is true in the world because of this state. Uh, um. Um, great, I, I think um, th there's a, there's a follow-up question to the to the question asked by one of the panelists, Julia Schoenherr. And Alex Salt asks, I think Professor Fine's response to Soames on semantic relationism suggests the response to Julia Schoenherr's question. We see the influence of the top-down approach to semantics in the relationism and the bottom-up approach in the fact that names refer obliquely as in Frege. I would love to hear what Professor Fine thinks about this suggestion. Um, so that, that's from Alex Salt. Yeah. Well, I really haven't thought seriously about how to combine these semantic approaches, so I prefer not to, to say yeah, anything. Yeah. Um, um, I, th I think it's an interesting uh, question. Um, I have to confess, you know, um, I'm not a coherent thinker, so I have these ideas and I don't actually know how they, so the ideas arise from very particular problems. So I think, well, this is, but um, I don't actually know how the various ideas fit together. And actually, I think that's a mistake to try to develop a coherent point of view um, mm. uh, because I think these sort of global considerations of coherence can lead you away from the truth. So often very mm. systematic considerations. Physics is a wonderful example of this. Physics isn't coherent, but it has these wonderful theories that deal with this phenomenon and that phenomenon. If, they'd, if the physicists had been interested in coherence, they never, it would never have made the progress that it did. And philosophers are too interested, it seems to me, in developing a coherent systematic point of view. They're li likely to miss out on, uh, on illuminating solutions to problems, particular problems that they face. Um, anyway, I just, I just want to throw that in. <laughs> mm. I think I think that's a beautiful, that's, that, beautiful that's, that's comment. The, actually, that's the, that's the excuse for my laziness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I th I think there are there are a couple of questions that were uh, kind of related um, uh, from from a few of the uh, people in the audience. So the first one goes like this: Is hyper is the hyper-intentional revolution genuinely revolutionary? What if I can account for the difference between A and uh, A or A and B in terms of inferences, which might constitute the meaning of connectives of the propositions in question? For instance, the differences of the two can be accounted for by different inference routes. But if this is possible, it seems that meanings don't come from below at all from the world. And th yeah, there was another question related to this about disjunction. Um, um, yes, yes, that, that's yeah. an interesting thought. So uh, clearly there are other ways of accounting for, for the difference. Um, on a structuralist conception of propositions, for example, there would be a clear difference between A and A or mm -hmm. A and B because we would think of the propositions expressed by the sentences 
as having a, stru a structure similar, akin to the structure of the sentences themselves. Um, so it's certainly not necessary uh, to think of these differences in the bottom-up uh, way. Um, but I guess the thought is that um, uh, it's, uh, so what's revolutionary is not really uh, thinking that you might be able to account for the differences in some way or another. It's A, wanting to account for them in this very particular way in terms of this bottom-up approach that is the exact truth makers. Uh, and, and secondly, thinking that various um, non-psychological uh, concepts uh, should take account of differences of this of this sort. Uh, so, uh, so I think it's the the rev what's revolutionary. Uh, it's, 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 I shouldn't call it a revolution. This is Nolan's term, anyway. So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, if you like, what if anything is revolutionary is is the, those those two aspects of of it. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, Okay, I think I think we have time for um, one or two more questions. I think uh, so. There's um, there are also a couple of questions. For instance, compare comparing the truth maker semantics to uh, the default logics. You you men you mentioned uh, you mentioned the default logics. Um, in your talk, mm -hmm. but um, so so I guess one of the questions here is hyper intentional reasoning happens to be found in other logics and formal settings. Why is truth maker semantics better than, for instance, the default logics? Um, yeah. uh, it's quite a broad well, question, but yeah, default logic is. Well, I guess it's many different things, but it, it's it's quite it's quite different. So um, uh, so normally within default logic, you would allow the substitution of classical equivalents. That's not really in question. Uh, so uh, you know. What's that bird called? They have a, what's a standard, what's a generic name for a bird? Um, anyway, peak, peak is a bird, therefore uh, peaky flies, and then you add the premise, uh, peak is a, uh, uh, what's a bird that doesn't fly? Um, uh, penguin, penguin, penguin. Fly. Pe ping is a penguin, yeah. Pe peak is a penguin, and, and now you can no longer make the inference. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of phenomenon a lot of these people are interested in. They couldn't care less whether you formulated those premises in logically equivalent terms. Okay, so that's uh, so it's a different. Uh, it's not the, it's not the, it's not even hyperintentionality. It's it's a feature of a certain feature of deduction that they're questioning, namely that the addition of premises will preserve a, a, valid, a valid argument. And that's a different. That's a different thing. The uh, the what I was the reason I talked about default logic is. This this is a, um, a, just another instance of monotonicity, or a monotonicity requirement. That that, um, that you know that if you increase something, you can still get the same out of it. That's that's the monotonicity assumption. And I'm saying monoton uh, these default logics question that assumption. So if you increase the premises, you add more premises, you can't necessarily get the same out of it. And similarly. If you increase a truth maker, you can't necessarily get the same sentences true. So I just was drawing an analogy that this, both these cases are failing monotonicity, and also pointing out uh, that there's a very, in both cases, there's a very natural inclination to accept monotonicity. Um, um, so that, that was the point of the analogy. But we, we, as I say, we don't really have hyperintentionality in the case of default logic. I don't, I, at least not no. as it's standardly construed, yeah. Yeah. I, as far as I'm aware, anyway, yeah. 